Welcome to the Cambridge Financial Podcast with Bert Salazar, CEO at Cambridge Financial Partners, LLC. This podcast is all about tax-preferred retirement planning, economics, financial risk management, and achieving a risk-free and successful financial life. Now, your host, Bert Salazar. Bert Salazar. Hey, good day, everyone. Welcome to the Burt Salazar Retirement Show. This is uh, episode 152, and this is going to be all about inflation, and the t- title of the episode is Inflation, the Silent Killer of Retirement. And uh, I want to kind of apologize to all of you because I've been gone. I have taken a three-week hiatus, hiatus uh, from doing our weekly podcast, and I want to thank each and every one of you that has sent me either a text message or uh, an email wondering, you know, whether I was okay or not. But, you know, as an accountant, I'm in, I'm in the middle. I was in the middle of tax season. And uh, finally, I was able to get through it yesterday. And, yeah, I do have a lot more gray hairs. And this was an, a very interesting tax season because clients were non-responsive. A lot of my clients I had to chase them down for the information. And finally, you know, giving them an ultimatum that either they... Uh, submitted the information that I needed or they could find another tax preparer to work with them and you know obviously most of them came through I still have uh, some that I have on extensions and so forth but you're always going to have those but the vast majority of my clients uh, both on the business and on the personal side um, are already done as of uh, yesterday, May 17th, 2021, so I'm excited about that. But I do I do want to thank you all, and I've missed you as well, because I enjoy, you know, having these conversations with all of you on a weekly basis. So uh, we're now going to be moving forward for the rest of the year. So once again, uh, this is episode 152, and my name is Bert Salazar, and I'm always a host uh, for the Bert Salazar Retirement Show, and um You know, the hiatus kind of gave me a bunch of ideas that I want to bring to you over the next few weeks. So, um, you know, one of the things that I want to talk to you about today, and the only thing I want to discuss with you today, is inflation and the impact that inflation is having uh, today, especially uh, after this report that I'm going to share with you, um, and and what the impact is going to be in the future. So, um, I just received last week, obviously, I belong to, to many organizations, and I receive um, uh, reports and research uh, reports and so forth from um, governmental agencies and, and so forth. And I received a love letter last week, uh, to say the least, from the Bureau of uh, Labor Statistics, uh, better known as uh, the BLS. And the new report that I received last week uh, basically stated that the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, has increased to 4.2% um, or has increased 4.2% since April 20th uh, of last year. So just in the past uh, year, uh, we have seen a tremendous increase in inflation in the United States. And and by the way, as an FYI to all of you, that is the highest rate of inflation since uh, 2008. So it's it's quite alarming, uh, at least for me it is, from that perspective. Now, uh, just so you get an idea why and how the Bureau of uh, Labor Statistics uh, gathers this information, you know, the CPI uses uh, common goods and, uh, and services that the average American uh, purchases and or uses on a regular basis. So they take a look at the pricing from one year to the next on a um, on a basket of goods and services, and uh, they're able to determine, you know, pricing increases and so forth along those lines. Now, some parts of the country may be a little bit lower than others, but this is on an average uh, basis for the entire nation. Now, what does a 4.2% uh, increase in inflation or a 4.2% inflation rate uh, tells us uh, all that are listening to this podcast today? Well, a couple of things. Um, uh, you either must uh, earn at least 4.2%, not including taxes, because remember, taxes are not tax deductible when it comes to inflation, or 
your savings or investments, or uh, you must have to get pay raises, increases to account for the current inflationary trend. So either you have to be earning at least 4.2% on your investments and your savings, not including taxes, or you have to continue to increase your uh, income by at least 4.2%, again, not including taxes uh, on an annual basis, or at least over the last 12 months, in order to be able to offset uh, the increase um, in inflation that we have seen over the past 12 months. So uh, I think one of the one of the key things that we need to pay attention to is why is inflation increasing at this time? Um, and, and there are a number of different items that uh, we can all pay attention to. But at the end of the day, I always like to keep things uh, simple for, for all of you because it makes it a lot easier for all of us to understand um, uh, down the line anyway. So uh, why is inflation increasing at this time? Well, it is based on the increase of our money supply. Uh, so, you know, you say, well, Bert, what do you mean by an increase on, on the money supply? Well, uh, think of it this way. Uh, imagine that all U.S. money becomes, you know, 10 times higher overnight. So that means uh, a dollar is worth, ten, is now $10. Uh, $10 is now $100. $100 is now $1,000. $1,000 is now 10000 and so on and so on and so forth. So that means that if you had X amount of dollars in your bank account, now it's worth 10 times that. Now, uh, when you look at it from that perspective, you may say, you know, Bert, what's wrong with that? I mean, that would be a good thing. Now, uh, yes, uh, and, and this sounds very nice at this point in time, but now you have to understand the rest of the story because at the end of the day, if you're going to make any type of financial decisions, not only do you have to look at them through a microscope, but you also have to look at them through a telescope. And this is the one area that I want to devote a little bit of time uh, on. So... Uh, what happens is that the additional money supply, you know, causes uh, immediate inflation. Now the question is, well, why does it do that? Why does uh, having more and more money circulating in the economy, why would that um, create an immediate uh, inflationary period? Well, the challenge is that the balance of supply and demand has been artificially distorted. And then, and this has been happening in the U.S. Uh, at least over the past um, uh, year and some months. You know, every time all of these, um, all of these uh, COVID-related uh, uh, money supply increments that we are seeing, you know, the um, uh, what happened under the Trump administration by giving people a lot of money. Uh, now what is happening with the Biden administration by increasing that money supply and just, you know, pretty pretty much uh, having the Treasury just print. Uh, trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars uh, in order to mitigate some circumstance that they want to uh, take a look at. Uh, that is what it's um, distorting the balance of supply and demand in the United States. And it has been done artificially because it's not that there's tremendous growth. It's just that the Treasury has decided to start printing all of this money and, and putting all of those uh, monies into circulation, and that's creating a major, major problem for, for all of you. So uh, what happens is that when you have a, a total disbalance between supply and demand, that means that too much money is actually chasing after too few goods. So if you have too much money, if you have too much demand, but the supply is not there, uh, what that is doing is it, it's increasing the value of those uh, few products and services that are available because there are so many people and there's so much money chasing after it. Uh, so um, just so for your information, uh, the Federal Reserve um, measured um, as part of their M2 calculations that the money supply in the United States has increased more than 32.9, almost 33% since January of 2020. Now, let me repeat that because that's very important for all of us to see and to understand. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the quantity of money supply measured, measured as M2 by the Federal Reserve has increased almost 33% 
since January of 2020. Now, that actually means that approximately 25% of the money in circulation today has been created since January 2020. So that means that, you know, the, the, the supply side of the house has not been able to catch up to the demand side. So therefore, uh, the prices uh, are increasing dramatically. And we have to be very careful because that may go on uh, for the next several years unless um, uh, the Treasury and the Federal Reserve decide to do some tightening along those lines. But who knows, you know, based on all the proposals that we see in Congress, the increase in taxes, uh, uh, the increase in, in the expenditures. I mean, just take a look at the national debt today. It's the highest we've ever had in the history of our country. And most important, the national deficit, which is the difference between what we bring in as a country versus what we pay out, uh, has been the highest ever. So if we have the highest national debt and the highest deficit, and we're actually living in the third lowest historical tax rate in history, you know, what do you think is going to happen to taxes? And no, obviously, we already know because uh, the proposals are there, and they're now going to have to start marching through Congress to see if they're going to be approved, and if they're going to be approved, uh, which ones are going to be approved, and which ones are not, and so forth. So uh, there's a tremendous uh, nebulous uh, process that is taking place as I conduct this podcast on on your behalf. That is something that we need to pay attention to. So, uh, as consumers, and 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 what is happening as well is now we're getting toward the end of the pandemic, and you know, thank goodness for that 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 we're almost at the, at the very end. Although anything can happen, but at this point in time. You know, states are opening up. The federal government and the CDC has already said that, you know, you don't have to wear a mask if you've been vaccinated. As more and more Americans get vaccinated, they're going to have a lot more freedom freedom to be able to, to go out um, and do the things that we as Americans are so accustomed to, to do on an ongoing basis. So uh, as, as consumers return, return to normal economic activities, the new money begins to circulate throughout the economy because now we're out there and we're spending more. You know, things like restaurants, uh, car purchases, uh, energy and gasoline prices, and I'm not even taking into consideration what happened now with the the pipeline um, that, you know, we've been dealing with for the last two weeks. But I'm just talking about the uh, traditional increase in general gasoline prices that we're seeing when people are out there uh, moving around. Uh, real estate, that's also a big issue right now. Banks um, is another one. They have now more money to, to be able to lend to consumers. Uh, for instance, when it comes to real estate, uh, the cost of wood and construction items uh, to build homes is increasing because the demand is greater than the supply. And I think at the end of the day, the key from a takeaway is to make certain that if you want to keep things at par, there has to be a balance uh, between supply and demand. If you try to artificially increase one or push one against the other, then there are going to be all of these macroeconomic issues that are going to be happening when you start to to play with supply and demand. So um, what this does, it it causes pricing to increase because a hurricane of demand has flooded the economy and the supply side of the equation has not been able to catch up um, as of yet. So um, we have some major issues in this country because, you know, I would hope that in the future, and I don't think that's ever going to happen, that instead of electing more politicians, that we have an opportunity to elect more mathematicians. Because if we were able to elect more mathematicians to Congress, then we wouldn't find ourselves in the mess that we're in today. Because when you take a look at the unfunded liabilities for Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, Medicare Part D, and the interest of the national debt is uh, fast appro- approaching $160 trillion and counting, it's going to be an impossibility for us to get out. There's not enough money in this country, even if you want to tax 100% of every dollar that the wealthy earns, there's not enough money in this country to be able to in this country to be able to offset uh, those uh, tax liabilities. So, 
I guess the other item, now that we've talked a little bit about the, the, the BLS and, and what it does and how does it measure CPI and, and why is inflation increasing at this point in time, the other item is, you know, what are consumers doing? And this is something that I pay a lot of attention to because I'm a consumer, just like each and every one of you is. So I always pay attention as to what is happening, what are the trends because at the end of the day, I want to be ahead of the trend. I don't want to be behind it because I want to be able to maximize not only the, the return on my investments and the return on my income and so forth, but I also want to maximize the benefit that I provide to all my clients when it comes to retirement distribution planning, tax planning, and, and accounting and bookkeeping and so forth. So uh, what, are, what are consumers doing today? Well, they're actually starting to fight our centralized monetary system. You know, the, the centralized monetary system that we have had in this country for uh, decades, I would, I would argue for almost 200 years, is one that has created a tremendous amount of havoc uh, and, and, and distrust in what we're doing today. So uh, the new consumers are fighting our centralized monetary system, and they're doing so. And one of the major issues in which they're fighting it, you know, take a look at cryptocurrency values. I mean, they have increased dramatically since January of 2020. I remember a year ago, it was, a, it was um, or a year and a half ago, it was approximately $600 billion uh, market. Uh, today is north of a $2 trillion market in a matter of a year, maybe a little bit over a year. Uh, and, and it's now, for the first time, considered to be an asset class for the first time in history. Now, we don't have time, and I have put out a couple of podcasts on cryptos, and I'll continue to do that because, you know, I am now dealing when I do tax planning and when I do tax preparation with my clients. I am now dealing with, you know, how to, how to pay the taxes on cryptocurrencies and so forth. Uh, but there's a lot of misinformation regarding the crypto world. You know, whenever you ask someone about crypto, the first thing that they tell you is, oh, yeah, um, I hear about Bitcoin. Well, Bitcoin just happens to be one of those coins. Uh, it's not the crypto market overall. Uh, yes, it is the largest one in the crypto world. Uh, but there are so many other things that are happening in that world right now that is actually having a positive impact in how the centralized world is going to try to uh, compete at some point in time in the future. So um, it is uh, the other thing that uh, that the cryptocurrency market is doing, besides the fact that it has become an asset class for the first time in history, is that it's shifting the economic power from the few to the many via decentralized economic systems, so something called DeFi. So what is happening is now in the centralized world, you know, the few, the, the, the Treasury, the Federal Reserve, they get, they, they get to control the decision-making process for the many, and we all have to abide by it, whether we agree with it or not, whether it's good for us or not. Um, it's just that those few people are going to determine you know, what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. And that that puts a tremendous amount of power. This is not something that the U.S. Constitution uh, intended to, because the Constitution never wanted to put a tremendous amount of power on one group and or one uh, certain amount of people. So uh, what, what the cryptocurrency world is doing is uh, making a shift, uh, of the economic power from the from the few to to the many, um, and uh, take a look, for instance, uh, at the uh, Federal Reserve Bank. You know, in a nutshell, and I and I will be doing a uh, total podcast or a complete podcast on the Federal Reserve Bank because I you know I've been uh, studying the Federal Reserve uh, system for many many years. But just to give you a small caveat of, the, of that, is that the Federal Reserve Bank is not federal. It's not a reserve, and it's not a bank. Now, come to figure. You know, you go figure how that how can that happen. Well, that's the way it is in our economic world today. So the power of the U.S. Treasury is um, actually quite dangerous, you know, to, to my concern. And so is the power of the IRS. So the IRS is now going to be, obviously, once it goes uh, through Congress, is going to be taxing the heck out of us. And for those of you that feel that... 
under the Biden administration, only people that make in excess of $400,000 are the ones that are going to suffer some tax increases. I do not believe that at all. There's, there are not enough people in the United States that make over $400,000 that would have any type of impact on our national debt and or our national deficit. Everyone is going to pay the taxes. The other thing that's going to happen along those lines, if you start raising the taxes on uh, corporations, if you're going to start raising the taxes on capital gains, remember, the reason why capital gains enjoy a lower uh, tax rate than ordinary uh, income taxes is that someone that is um, impacted by capital gains um, has to have uh, their money at risk. So the same way that you can get a capital gain, you can get a capital loss. You know, you can go into the community, you can get a loan from a bank, uh, you can open a restaurant, and within two years, a restaurant goes belly up. Well, that was your money because you still owe the money to that banking institution. So in order for the economy to grow, uh, the IRS over the years has said, look, if you're willing to invest money into the economy, if you're willing to hire employees, if you want to participate in the growth of your community and this country, then we're willing to give you certain tax breaks that we would not give to someone who happens to be an employee. And I'm in I, I'm a, I totally believe, believe in that because I do tax planning every single day. So if you're willing to take a risk, you know, to better yourself, to better your family, and to better the economy, then you should all, always get some tax um, uh, benefits along those lines. Where we have to be careful is now that the, the, the new administration is thinking about uh, taxing the, the corporations and bringing it up to a 28% as opposed to a 21%. The question that all of us and that I'm hoping that I'm uh, educating you on, on on these podcasts that I do on a weekly basis, the question is, well, who's going to pay that tax? So if all of a sudden uh, the taxes for a given industry is going to go through the roof, uh, what do you think they're going to do? you think they're going to be absorbing that tax themselves? No, they're going to pass that tax on to the consumer. So they're going to be increasing the, the prices of the goods and services that they provide to the consumers. And then we, the middle class, and everyone in this country is going to have to pay for that tax because they're not going to pay for it themselves. Uh, so those are things that all of us need to pay attention to because when you listen to politicians, depending on which uh, side of the aisle you sit on, uh, you're going to hear all kinds of crap that uh, none of it is true. And, and most of these politicians have never run a business in their own, in, in their lives. And, and many of them have never, have never ever had a job in their lives. Uh, so who are they to tell us, you know, how to manage ourselves and how to manage our personal economy from a business standpoint? So um, now one of the major changes that I think is going to happen with a cryptocurrency that is going to have a positive impact on the not only the decentralized system that we're moving toward at this point in time, but also the centralized system that we have all been used to living for, you know, the last couple of hundred years or so, is that, you know, blockchains and smart contracts uh, will be governing the financial world in the very near future. Actually, they're starting to to govern that today. You know, some of the major financial institutions, uh, J, J.P. Morgan Chase, is now starting to look at blockchains in order to reduce the internal cost of uh, financial transactions uh, from peer-to-peer uh, -peer investments or company-to-company um, uh, -company and so forth. So those are things that you can invest in if you happen to be in the crypto world because it's like if somebody would have said to you, look, know what you know today about Home Depot. You know, how many shares of Home Depot would you have purchased when they became an IPO, you know, back in the 1970s? Well, I would argue you would have bought a, a, a lot. Or, you know, how many shares would you have bought of uh, Google or Apple or uh, Microsoft or, you know, all of those major companies um, or even Facebook or some of the virtual companies like Facebook and Twitter and, you know, LinkedIn and so forth. So uh, blockchains and smart contracts are going to be dictating because smart contracts will also give you the, the ability to execute a uh, contract uh, between uh, two processes or uh, two sides of the coin, and it's on a guaranteed basis. The other major advantage of blockchains 
is that they cannot be erased. So that means that when you execute a trade or when you execute a contract and it goes through the blockchain, it is there forever. So the many are now starting to control their own economy through the cryptocurrency. So what I can see from all the research that I've been doing is that, you know, major corporations and investors are starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And the light is going to be the, the, the crypto world. Now, there's so much misinformation. And, and believe me, the crypto market is a volatile market. You know, I'm not recommending, uh, I don't recommend when it comes to cryptocurrency, I cannot make recommendations. So it's not financial advice. The only thing that I do uh, with my clients and my online communities provide information and provide education. I do share from time to time what it is that I'm doing in, in, the, in the crypto world. Um, but uh, it's not uh, a recommendation to e any of you. It's more of what it is that I'm doing. And if you feel that it may be suitable for you, then you have to do what we call in the crypto world, DYOR, do your own research. Um, I think the one question that I want to leave you with as I close this podcast today is, you know, can you afford not to be involved in the, in the crypto world? Can you afford not to be involved in this new asset class? Now, you could be either a conservative investor. You, can be a, you could be a moderate investor. You could be an aggressive investor. But at any one of those uh, three levels or any combination thereof, um, the question is, can you afford not to be involved in the crypto world? You know, even if it's at a one to two or three or a five percent of your uh, retirement assets, you know that could be a win-win. Now you got to remember, if you're going to invest in the crypto world, don't invest anything that you cannot afford to lose, and that's something that I tell all my clients. So um, I'm very concerned about what's happening with inflation. I'm very concerned as to what's happening in our country with our governmental system. I'm very concerned about the in the potential increase. Uh, of taxes, especially at a time where, you know, the economy, uh, which was the number one uh, economy in the world uh, prior to the China virus, uh, is now rebounding. And, you know, we're going to uh, we're going to now be uh, stepping on the accelerator at the same time that we're stepping on the on the brakes. And that's not something that we want to do. So the increase in inflation, the increase of taxes, the increase of the money supply, money supply is not helping us at all. So we need to be very careful of that. Take a look at your retirement assets today because a dollar that, that you owe today or that you had last year, uh, that you owned last year, you know, is only worth, it's actually worth less than 96 cents today. So, you know, what are you going to do in order to alleviate, alleviate that, that painful, um, uh, reduction in, in, in purchasing power? You have to do something about that. So for those of you that may want to reach out to me, as always, uh, feel free to call me at area code 786-766-1042. You can also send me an email at Bert, B-E-R-T, at BertSalazar.com. And uh, also always remember that my goal for each and every one of you um, on a weekly basis with these podcasts and my YouTube channel and my Vimeo channel and my, you know, my uh, webinars and, and video conference that I do on an ongoing basis um, is, is, is to kind of help you change uh, the way that you see things because when you change the way that you see things the things that you see change so once again i'm so happy to be back i'm so excited to be here with all of you i'm happy that i has i have been able to get through another tax season uh, which was uh, full of um, um, challenges and, and by the same token opportunities and i'll talk to you again uh, very soon. So take care and take care of yourselves and have a great day.